Wow. This is quite a crowd for such a vague and trivial sentence I have selected as a topic of my presentation. Welcome, everyone. Hello. My name is Natalia Sakowska. I am a software engineer at Google. And today I would like to argue that building distributed systems is hard. I plan to use some examples from the uh, GC Autoscaler backend I am working at, at Google. Uh, let me introduce myself, and don't worry, uh, this will be quick. Um, I was uh, studying mathematics and computer science at Warsaw University, and just afterwards, so five and a half years ago, I joined Google to work on, well, Actually, um, after surviving the initial period of being completely overwhelmed by my first job and seeing the main CC file being as long as all the code I have written during the studies. So after surviving this period, I started working on infrastructure, first internal, then external, and here I am. I have learned a lot during this period. Now I, I am a technical lead of a small team working on GCE autoscaling and deploying containers to GCE VMs. And here you can see me in my natural environment. Uh, so this should serve as an answer what I am doing uh, when I am not implementing any code, writing design docs, or responding to emails. And yeah, these are pictures from beautiful places all around the world. But let's zoom out a little bit. This is Earth. Earth is a big planet, and according to the newest measurements or estimations, 7.6 billion people live on this planet. So quite many, huh? Um, more than 50% of these people had internet access last year. That would make an astonishing number of, the, of around 4 billion. So quite a bigger crowd than you are folks here today. Um, I don't know how many of these people use Google services and have ever had heard about Google. I need to guess, but I would guess that the vast majority has heard about Google and is using at least one of the services we have. Of course, some of these people are not addicted to technology and use internet every now and then. Some of them would like to use it more often, but don't have such possibilities. But more and more people are using internet very heavily. Also, it's not that we have only one service. Although search was the first one and is still perceived as the service, we have quite more of them. So we have Gmail, Chrome, Maps, Search, YouTube, Google App, uh, Google Play Store, Android, and Drive. These are the eight apps that have one billion users monthly. We have more of these apps. Um, actually, uh, a dozen or a couple dozens of services. Some of them are more popular, some of them are less popular, but we want all our services to be at the highest possible quality and offer the best user experience. That means high responsiveness rate and low latency. To be able to achieve that, with growing adoption of our core services and the growing number of services, we need a lot of compute power, and that's why we're building data centers. So in one data center, we have thousands and thousands of computers. Sorry for not being able to uh, be accurate here. Um, and um, I would guess that these thousands of computers in one data center would, ser would be enough to serve to all of the users of Gmail. So you could, you we could be building data centers this way, that one data center will be solely responsible for Gmail, another one solely for search, and so on. But this approach has two main problems. One, it has a single point of failure. So, of course, we try to build data centers in a way that are, they, are, they are resistant to any possible issues that could happen, um, but you cannot, you cannot prevent anything, everything. You cannot predict everything. So think about um, tsunamis, earthquake, wars. These are things that we cannot be in any way uh, prepared for. So if anything goes wrong with a data center, we don't want the whole service to go down. The second issue is latency. If we had uh, one service 
prepare a data center, we would have a user that, you, that lives in Europe and wants to use a service, would have to wait until it contacts a data center in US that in return needs to fetch some data from a data center in Asia that needs to contact a service in Europe that it needs to get some more data from Asia and so on. So this would take much more time uh, for the user to get the response to their query as they should. So this is why we decided for distributed architecture for our services at Google. So instead of having Gmail or Search or any other service uh, working only in one data centers, we have them replicated and sharded all around the globe. Uh, so that the services are close to the user. And please note here that it's not only enough that the service itself is close to the user, is that its dependencies need to be close to the user too. So uh, actually most of the internal services are dependencies for some external services. So that basically means that most of the Google services need to be replicated and sharded around the globe. Here you can see a map of public data centers. Uh, we have some more internal ones, but unfortunately this is the only map that I can uh, share with you. Um, and yeah, this is how it looks like. All these all this services need to be... I have some... All these services need to be implemented, and we have thousands of Google engineers working on that. And the question I could be asking here is whether all these engineers should be, should be solving the same problems. And let me answer it for you. No, they should not be solving the same problems. They should be able to concentrate on their services, on the problems the services have and the challenges, so that they can work on things they have great expertise in, great knowledge, that actually are interested to them and not to invent the wheel over and over again. So this is why we have a set of tools, libraries, frameworks, practices, policies that should help us to not repeat the same um, solution, solutions all the time. Uh, the greatest help is Borg, which is our internal cluster management system. And Borg is there to schedule all the services, scripts, uh, jobs we want to run uh, as developers. And uh, Borg is doing a very good job with scheduling this, the services on computers. So it, uh, it achieves high utilization of the computers, at the same time not disturbing the end users. So um, it uses different scheduling policies and priorities, and it treats differently a service that has a great adoption, is externally visible, and needs high, uh, high latency, and the test, uh, batch, test, um, test batch job uh, running by an engineer. Um, so the way Googlers use Spark is that we provide declarative manifest when we specify the parameters we want uh, a particular run of a job to be run with. And then it, everything happens automatically. The job is, is being started. The job is being monitored all the time. Whenever there are some problems, a machine goes down or our, uh, serve, uh, our binary crashes, it will be uh, restarted and it will be taken over. There is also a UI where we can see all the, the tasks running and see the state they're in, their logs and everything we could be possibly interested in. All right, so that's a good moment for a disclaimer. Internally, at Google, we don't think about data centers as a set of computers. Uh, we rather think about it as a set of resources. So a set of CPUs, TPUs, GPUs, whatnot, a set of disks, set of RAMs, set of Lego bricks that we can build things, like our own computers, out of it. The VM shapes are not set in stone, and we can manipulate them depending on what our needs are. So that if I, if my service needs less CPU and my and more memory, and my colleague the other way around, we don't need to waste like three whole computers. We can use, we can waste only two. Um, I said a moment ago that in Borg, uh, we 
uh, that the Borg the applications are, are packed up on a computer and that Borg is doing it effectively. So you might think that as a service owner, I need to specify how much resources my application needs. So how much CPU or RAM, for example. Uh, and un unfortunately, this is not the case. So we have an internal service that does these estimations for us. Uh, it looks at the historical usage of services and tries to predict the future needs of a specific application. Also, it reacts, uh, it, like it does live corrections. So whenever there is a spike uh, in load, it, it, it applies uh, this, um, these computations and uh, like increases the number of resources needed for a, uh, for a service. Not only we do not need to worry about how much resources our applications need, but we also do not need to worry where to run them. So we have a uh, help, uh, a tools that help us to say in which locations, in which data centers we should run uh, our services. Also, the, some other tools that care for um, maintenance windows of these data centers. So every now and then you need to turn down some computers and then you don't need to worry about the services that are running on these computers because they will be migrated automatically for you. Um, while Borg packs all these services on computers, it sometimes need, it needs to preempt some of the services uh, because uh, one of the services it, uh, or a few services are receiving higher load than expected. And in that case, some of the services, some of the jobs running needs to be preempted. And this is why we have priorities. So we treat differently different type of jobs, depending whether it's monitoring or a production service or a test application or a batch computation that can be uh, actually rescheduled without any consequences. So we have these uh, priorities there. And also the last thing I wanted to uh, talk uh, while, while about when I'm talking about scheduling is CRUN. So we have a framework that would help us uh, schedule scripts and tasks to run at a specific point of time or periodically, like every hour or every two or three hours, whenever we need them, and we do not have to do it manually. Each actively developed service needs to be released every now and then. And the question is how to do these releases. Of course, we, we, we test our code thoroughly and we hope there are no bugs there. We do unit tests and integration tests and manual tests, but actually you can never be sure. There can be some bugs that can be detected only in production environments and are very difficult to spot earlier. Uh, it's possible that you have just skipped uh, some of the uh, test cases. Well. We're only humans. So this is why we don't want to release every, uh, everywhere at once. We don't want to take new binary and put it like in all data centers at once. We want to do a gradual release, uh, data center by data center. And we also here have some tools that would help us do so. Uh, tools like that would uh, do auto cuts and every and build uh, hourly or daily releases and then push them to the environments we specified. Uh, we do a lot of testing to be sure that we can that we can go on with the pushes. Uh, so we have a dedicated environments where we test production how the production systems production version of systems work with soon-to-be production version of systems and other test environments where we test soon-to-be production systems with versions that are also soon-to-be production so that we change that we test a lot of different combinations and how they are going to work with each other um, we do push on greens uh, we do Ca we canary binaries, we do canary comparators, so we look how the old binary, like the old version and new version are working and try to compare them with each other. Of course, not every team is using all this technique. Each team has to design on their own what they're doing and also uh, sometimes need to invest and write some code and prepare the framework to be suitable for them. But basically we have a very strong culture of testing at Google and we are okay with sacrificing that the, the, the pace uh, of adding new features and new products 
uh, because we want to be sure that we are not going to break the existing clients and existing setups of these clients. So I only started listing some of the problems that we are trying to solve generally at Google. And I think you might feel that we have some intuition on how to build services well at Google. So it might not sound irrational that at some point we decided to pack this expertise and offer it externally as Google Cloud. So the message here is the same. External developers should also not be working on this boring maintenance stuff. They should be able to concentrate on their needs of their services and work solely on their services. The smallest unit uh, we sell as Google Cloud is a virtual machine. So think about it as a computer where you can run any code you want, deploy any application you want, that is somewhere in the cloud that is completely safe, that is non-breakable, that you don't need to W that you don't need to care about power outages or that the machine breaks or that the new operation system patches need to be installed. It's there, it's waiting for you and you just take the benefits out of it. And when defining a, a virtual machine, uh, you need to, you can choose a bunch of parameters like starting from shape, image, uh, you can have GPUs, TPUs, you can have a container running on this uh, VM. You have a quite a lot of choice uh, here. Also, if you are more into risk, you can choose that you want to use a preemptible VM, which is less expensive, but also less predictable because it can be preempted any moment. Users often start with this tiny, one tiny VM, they play around, they even start some production systems with individual machines uh, to see how it works. But eventually their services get more and more popular and they need more compute power. So this is when they might want to choose um, instance group to have a pool of homogeneous instances that are uh, described described in an instance template. So whenever a new VM is added to the pool, it's added according to the receipt that is received that is uh, in the instance template. Uh, this is a nice setup. Customers can have just, um, uh, just an instance group and add uh, instances manually every now and then if they need it. Uh, if they don't have rapid spikes and they have a very uh, predictable usage, they can be doing so. But this is troublesome and it's, it needs human attention. Uh, it might be that at some point some machines are not utilized, so they are idle and uh, the service owners might want to kill these instances. So if you want to do it by human, we need even more human attention and human won't ever be able to do it perfectly, uh, to sit and add and delete new instances whenever it's needed. Also, what if you have more groups of the instances? Do you want to look at all of them? Uh, it's like a wasted effort. So, hey, we have an, ex we have an, ex mm, an answer to this problem. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce GC Autoscaler. So this is a product that does exactly so. So whenever there is higher load, it adds more instances, and when your instances are idle, it deletes the instances, so that you can uh, have all your customers happy and served, but at the same time, you don't need to pay for uh, not used compute power. How do you configure Autoscaler? Well, you have three possible metrics to scale by. So we have CPU utilization, HTTP load balancer, or stack driver metric. Actually, you can have much more because you, you can combine and use multiple metrics out of this. But let's stick to the simple example. Uh, CPU and HTTP load balancing usage, I guess, should sound um, quite obvious. Stack driver metric is any metric that can be exported. Either the infrastructural one, something like bytes sent by an instance or the length of the PubSub queue. Or it can be a custom metric defined by the user and exported by them, and it can be anything, like any time series. It could be even, I know, a temperature, if you think it makes sense. We just will be scaling looking at this metric. How will we be scaling? So the next thing that user needs to specify is target. 
target utilization here in the example is 60% of CPU. And that means we will try to maintain the average among all instances of the signal you have selected to be at 60%. So if signal is above 60%, we add instances. If it's below, we delete instances. Also, we specify minimum and ma maximum number of instances, so kind of a sanity requirements and auto scaling. Auto scaler will never uh, get out of these bounds. And the cooldown period is the last parameter, is the time when your VM is booting up, so it's doing something strange for them, not serving, not yet, um, not yet something that this VM is uh, there for. And last thing I want to talk about uh, cloud is that we have also regional offering. So in a um, cloud nomenclature, we have regions and zones. Region can be something like US Central 1, whereas zone could be US Central 1A, US Central 1B, US Central 1C. I guess actually there are quite more regions in US Central 1, but it doesn't matter, it's just an example. And user might want, might want to run their services, but they might not be really interested which zone they are they are running it in. They might they might know that they have clients in in the central U.S. and they want to have their service there, but they don't know which zone and they do not want to care. Again, also they might be might be. Um, worried that uh, the zone will be unavailable because control plane crashes because uh, zone I know burn uh, the, the data center burns or something unexpected happens or there is a stock out of resources and you cannot create uh, new VMs in this uh, in this in this zone so whenever you have um, Original managed instance group, and one zone is unav unavailable for some reason. Your load will be spilled over to other zones, and you have like a backup plan. So this is pretty convenient because you don't have to worry about the location too much. Uh, in a and in ideal healthy situation, uh, the number of instances will be balanced across zones. So if you have nine instances in a region, that would mean that you have three instances in each zone. Uh, assuming that the region has free zones, of course. Okay, so now uh, once you know more about what GC Autoscaler is, let me come back to other difficulties we have when building distributed systems at Google. So the one, the another one is a scale. So we have a really a lot of samples. So. Uh, in case of autoscaler, we receive a samples every couple of seconds for each of the instance that we uh, that belongs to an instance group that we are scaling. So that means really a lot of samples. What we do about it? Well, we don't keep raw samples. We keep aggregations of the samples, and also we try to keep zones and instances of autoscaler backends independent of each other. Next interesting think is replication. At Google, we really believe in replication. So no serious service can run in one copy only. It should be replicated. Uh, some tasks can go down. It can be a machine problem, like a hardware problem. It can be a software problem that your application just crashes. In any way, you should have other replicas that could take over and do the job that this prime replica was doing. Um, and among all replicas, you often need a master, so the most important task. And uh, Google has an excellent algorithm and excellent libraries to do master election that is based on Paxos algorithm. And Paxos it's, is an algorithm that tries to seek consensus in a distributed network of processors. And we use it beneath to be able to choose a master among replicas. In our case, uh, the case of GC Autoscaler, it means that each replica reads all the data. So it reads all the data about usage, so the CPU usage, load balancing, stack driver uh, metrics, uh, signals. Uh, it reads configuration data. It reads the um, data about uh, VM states and states of instance group. It builds the model of the world in the memory and computes periodically recommendations, so everything uh, what the master is doing. But the master is the only task that is allowed to do mutations. So master 
is actually doing the, the core of scaling, so it resizes the, 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 the instance group. And when the master changes, because a task crashes, goes down, machine goes down, or we do a new release, we have other tasks up there and running, ready to uh, actually just immediately start uh, auto-scaling. We might be waiting a couple of seconds so that we are sure that we all read in the data and we won't uh, have a situation where we go back and forth with some decisions a moment after, but other than that, there is no visible effect to the customers that uh, we changed the master uh, about, uh, among our replicas. When you have so many so many replicas, you need them to communicate with each other and you need to communicate with other systems. And Google helps here too. We have a protocol for jobs to communicate with each other, libraries uh, that we can use to send requests, libraries that we can use to authorize these requests. Uh, we have um, common agreement on the way we're sending things uh, between processes, so we keep we send them in protocol buffers. These are kind of JSONs, manifests, pairs of, of keys and values. Uh, and it, this way we know what to expect uh, as a service or as a sender. And uh, also to be sure that, that any service is not DDoSed by, uh, DDoSed by some other services, there is a mechanism of throttling when you can specify how many requests you allow for a particular other service to send you to you. Next difficult thing is data consistency. So Autoscaler has many different sources, free for the signals, remember CPU, LB, and stack driver. Uh, we, key, we read data about configs, we read states of VMs and so on. So this is quite many different, different um, different sources, and all this data can come in different order, and they might not be consistent with each other. Also, it might be a case that we are doing a resize on an instance group, so we want to grow and, and, and uh, grow a pool of VMs, we send a request to do so, and after a while we don't see an effect. We see that the, the pool is still small, so what we should do, well, we should do something sensible. At no means we cannot cr we can crash, right? We need to be uh, prepared that things might be out of sync, that uh, things might need to be repeated. We need to react I in any way, like in any situ in every situation is a little bit different. Sometimes you need to skip uh, the information. Sometimes you need to react to it and treat the first occurrence as the fact that something is there and create some objects in the memory. Anyway, you need to do something something um, reasonable. Also, simplifying things, our backends are reading from a, from a data database, and this database below needs to be replicated too. We use Spanner. Spanner is a, a good distributed database that um, promises global consistency. And by the way, Spanner is also available externally as, as Cloud Spanner. Last but not least, there is a problem what to do if one of the components fails. I'm actually wondering how many times today I have I am highlighting that these things are not common. We try to make to write services so that they don't break. We try to build data centers so that they don't break and they work and everything works fine. But we always try to think what happens if one of the services break. So we want as big part of the picture unaffected as possible. So if, for example, we have problems and, uh, and in the case of autoscaler, the signal source for CPU breaks and we don't get uh, sam samples about CPU, we still want to go do a job about uh, scaling all the instance groups that want to be scaled by load balancer, signal, or stack driver. So we want to be up and running and do as much as we can in these limited circumstances. So summing up, I have mentioned quite many problems we encountered dur during building distributed systems in Google. Uh, I'm sure there are more of them. Um, I have explained how we try to solve them and that we prefer to solve these problems once and general and not to have all the engineers solve the same problems over and over and again, but rather concentrate on their services, on the work that is interesting to them and that they wanted to work on. So 
the message is clear. We want you to work on what you want to work and what not wor on what you have to work. So this was it. I hope you enjoyed and thank you very much for your attention. And I'm open to questions now if there are any. Thank you.